today's video, we're going to be diving into the upcoming pattern, taking a look here at the European model, the GFS model, and a lot of the ensemble guidance, kind of trying to get a better grip of the upcoming pattern. This has been the theme the last couple of days as we've had the models flipping up and down with the expected temperatures, not only in the long range, but actually the medium range too. So it's been highly volatile. But we do seem to have pretty good legs to stand on right now. You guys know I'm always skeptical. Um, when we've had these big flips recently with the models, it tends to take a while for them to reestablish uh, the, the correct pattern that is expected. But that we could be in that right now. I, I really do think we could. So we're going to be looking at what they're showing for now, kind of giving you my opinion along the way. And it does look like we do flip colder at some point after the 10th. And there's two really big reasons why outside of the models, that seems to be a pretty high likelihood uh, two global indicators that we're going to look at today. I do want to wish a happy birthday to Green Blue Devi One, uh, who left a comment multiple weeks ago asking if I could say happy birthday today. I wanted to go ahead and make that birthday wish come true. I really, really hope that you had a great birthday. Let's go ahead and move on to the upcoming pattern and discuss what is upcoming. And it is interesting. Uh, it really is. We're not necessarily warm right now, for most areas at least. Uh, so our milder period hasn't even really begun. What's interesting is the... This is going to take a minute, but just, just bear with me. But when we look at the last like five winners as a whole, the first three of those uh, of the 2020s, if you will, really featured... Long warm-ups followed by small cool-downs. And the trend for all three of those winners is that when the models would show a long range or medium range big time cool-down that lasted long, one of two things would happen. It would either get kicked further down the road and just end up not really happening, or it would end up becoming less and less and le less of a factor as we got closer to where it ended up being a really quick more minor cooldown. Last winter and so far this winter, it's been the opposite. We've seen essentially long cooldowns with much shorter, much more minor warm-ups in general uh, for these previous two winters. And we've seen the models trying to show these long-term massive warm-ups, but they always ended up being shorter and in length, in time period. And I know we had that historically warm Christmas, but even that time period, when we looked at it about a week out, it looked warmer and it looked longer lasting than it ended up being. So that sentiment still stays true in that instance. With that in mind, let's go ahead and roll through things. Cause I know I've just been talking and not really showing a lot here, but we see this cooler period that we're in. We're, we're, we are gonna get a minor clipper through the Great Lakes, Mid-Atlantic and Northeast here over the coming days. Could drop a general one, two, three inches of snowfall. Wouldn't surprise me one bit. We do get another clipper system for the fourth into the fifth. So tomorrow night, actually, into the next day. These things just move in so fast. But this one does look a bit heavier. Still very quick moving like most clippers. I would say maybe pushing more so towards two, three, four, five inches of snowfall for some areas. Certainly the Great Lakes can get some lake effect enhancement snowfall there that does end up accumulating more uh, than oftentimes. And then we get another system moving very horizontally. This one's a lot less wintry as we're in that 6th, 7th, 8th period that is much warmer here. We know it's warmer because our 540 line is somewhere in here, which is very high up, especially for there to not really be a trough and a ridge. This is zonal, so just straight west to east across the nation. This is very high up, uh, meaning that we have a lot less Arctic air to work with at this point uh, than what is standard. And as we move through... That doesn't really change until we start approaching the 8th, 9th. And the first thing that happens, and it might seem unideal at first, is actually we get a lot of Arctic air entering into the more Rocky Mountain range. And the center of that trough would move right around the Rockies. And then we get a ridge out for the east. Mostly because we have some low pressure developing there between Kansas and Oklahoma. On the warm front side of things, we're actually getting more of a upward push happening that's trying to expand that warmth further northward but we do have a cold front underneath which is trying to advance this cooler air further southward here in the west so that is the flow because of where that low is located uh, we do see the threat for thunderstorms and perhaps severe weather texas oklahoma arkansas louisiana underneath this warm front and out ahead of the cold front would certainly watch out for that 
as we keep going, we see that low really rapidly moves through. Now by 7 p.m. on Friday, January 9th, located over Ohio, we do see some snowy conditions on the northern end of that precipitation. Um, and really, this cold air starts to orient itself much further to the east here, uh, kind of transitioning. And at this point, we do have a southeast ridge. It's not the the main typical reason that we see these southeast ridges, which would be a high pressure system off the east coast, causing that wind to flare up northward over the eastern states. This one is actually caused by the opposite, a low to the west, which is causing this upward motion to the east, encouraging this warmer air upward again where that warm front is located. That's going to be a lot more brief than if we had a high that was stationary off the east coast. So what we see is that generally that southeast ridge isn't going to be a major factor for a long time, at least not now on the models, which again, take it with a grain of salt. We're still trying to trust these models again, even for the medium range. You know, I get a lot of comments that are like, you know, you shouldn't even be talking about anything beyond five days out, but really that's the whole point of the channel. I'm not trying to only tell you what's 100% going to happen. If that was my focus, yes, I would only focus on the on the three days. But what I want to really work you guys and walk you guys through is those sure thing within three day events. We're going to talk about those. And then we're going to get into the medium confidence stuff where we're talking about chances and how they could change. Because some people need to know an idea of what to expect beyond that three day mark instead of just being totally blind. So that's why I pre present the raw information to you guys. And that's why I'm always gonna try to break down the pattern even to the very end of the model run. If we can get 10% value out of the tail end of the model run, I'm gonna give you guys that 10% uh, every single time. Now, as we keep going, uh, we do see a low developing near the south central states, which is interesting. We do have this really large dip of Arctic air into that section. Um, this isn't unheard of for these areas, especially West Texas into New Mexico. Um, definitely interesting, but not unheard of. Uh, we do have milder air out here in uh, over top of kind of like the Gulf states where perhaps we're seeing some thunderstorms here on the eastern end of things. That's by Monday the 12th. And as we keep going, uh, this actually turns into a very interesting situation where it's able to kind of kind of climb up the jet stream here that's sitting pretty vertically up the eastern states. We have a minor low here forming into a bit of a nor'easter for New England, and there's a stronger one actually just behind it. This is the interesting part because there's two of them. If over time, which at hours 252, this isn't really impossible or really even improbable, we might just see these become one low over time to where they really do away with the, the, the separate two separate low solution and they turn it into a lot more of that energy just forming into one low which what that would result in is a much stronger storm system a stronger individual storm system as opposed to having these lows kind of all over the place regardless we do see snow on the more interior side of things for both of these take it with a grain of salt this is a specific detail in the long range which you guys know i'm not a huge fan of uh, but pattern wise seeing this warm ridge built very sturdily over the western states and this arctic air just pouring into the east this is going to put us in good shape for any storm systems that move through to result in snowfall i know this looks good to a lot of you um i hope we do find ourselves in a pattern that could support something like this and right now the models are trending that way in a minute we're going to get into the why we're going to really dive into the why this has become such a high likelihood compared to just a couple of days ago because uh, things have really evolved and that cold air really sticks around for a while uh, it's not insane arctic air or anything here again we're at hours 360 very tail end of the model run uh, but pattern wise this jet stream continues to look descending towards the east more of a ridge out here in the west more of a trough in the east again not your super violent deep diving troughs here or anything but it certainly is a trough nevertheless and it would bring cooler air especially this being right after the peak of winter so this is your coldest averages of the entire year that we're dealing with here um it's not going to take a lot for it to be very cold GFS model is going to look a little less optimistic for cold and snow. We do get those clipper systems rolling through. We do get the colder air mass. We get a bit of like a Midwest Great Lakes system here right around the 10th as that's pulling through. And then here's where we do have a trough in the east, ridge in the west. And you can tell we have this low right here, but a lot of this low pressure is very broad. 
across a very horizontal area. So this allows for a lot of warm air to get involved here, which is why we don't see a very pure snowstorm up there in the northeast in this instance. Uh, we end up seeing more clippers. And then that colder air doesn't last super long until the end of the model run where we do get another major cold shot here, maybe around the 17th, although again, that's very far out. And it does look like more Arctic air is descending into the United States. And you might wonder to yourself, like, why, why are we all of a sudden seeing so much Arctic air available versus what the pattern looks like for early January where it seems like it's really hard to come by? I'm going to answer that question in a minute, but first off, we need to talk about the Pacific because this plays a huge role in our overall weather here in the United States. And this is for the 5th, so this is just two days from now, Monday the 5th, not even hardly. This is actually right around 1 a.m. on the 5th, so hardly even into the 5th. And what we're seeing is a ridge situated there in the very middle of the northern Pacific between western Alaska and just to the west of Hawaii. Then we have this kind of trough set up here closer to the areas tucked offshore of Canada and the United States there on their western coasts. You want the opposite of this because what this encourages is a ridge here, trough here, and then we can't see it on screen, but it's going to encourage ridging over the United States overall, uh, not troughing. What we see once we reach the 12th, which again, we do expect this pattern to begin changing sometime between the 8th and the 10th, and then really taking place over the 12th and beyond, we see a trough here over the areas between Hawaii and Alaska in the middle of the Pacific. And then we see a massive ridge here closer to the west coast of Canada and the United States. So the very, very opposite, what we're dealing with is a ridge, trough, ridge, and then you can imagine what's east of here is that jet stream diving southward, similarly to what we see it doing here. This is very supportive of cold air entering into the United States, and this is one of those core reasons why we do see the pattern flipping here from the models. Another one, which is mostly gonna play a bigger role actually after the 10th time frame. so this is more reason to believe that we're gonna cool down even further to a greater degree, maybe even seeing a polar vortex event towards later January into, into February, which I know is the very far long range, but these, what we call sudden stratospheric warming events, these are things that we can really, really see for two, three, four weeks out because what's causing that polar vortex to move towards the Canadian and US side of things three or four weeks from now is starting now. The, the cause of it is happening uh, here over the coming days. It takes forever for these to actually cause impacts, uh, which makes it really good for uh, kind of getting a good idea of when to expect them long in advance. And what we see is a colder Arctic. When we see this, all of that Arctic air is bottled up where it should be, the Arctic. And we deal with war slightly warmer to maybe near normal winter conditions for a lot of Europe, Russia, Asia, and even the United States and Canada here in these types of situations. As we move on, though, what can happen is we get warmer air situated over the Arctic, and that can cause that polar vortex to disrupt and displace. What we see happening over time, even though there's a little bit of blue still there near the Arctic Circle, we see a lot of warmth here, very close to the Arctic. And what ends up happening is that a lot of this Arctic air begins to trickle down into the United States and Canada, as you can see, in the form of a polar vortex event. This is, a, this is the GFS Ensemble model, so this is taking many different opinions and putting them together, which gives us a good idea of the likelihood of things, but we can't really visualize the specific details. So that's why we're going to move over actually to the European deterministic model, which is an individual model, so we can get a more high-resolution view of what these models are seeing. We see the warmer air work its in way in closer to the Arctic there around the 10th. We actually get a polar vortex split going on right here as we work our way into the extended range, 14, 15, 16 days out. So you've got this warmer air way up in the atmosphere. This is not at the surface. This is way up in the atmosphere. We're seeing this squeeze towards the Arctic. And instead of that being a huge circle of Arctic air, it actually is forced to split into two main air masses here. One that moves towards uh, Russia and Asia there, as you can see. And then one here that moves towards Eastern Canada and the Eastern United States. What's so crucial here is that this 
keeps its pipeline of Arctic air available. This is fully connected. This is not completely separated. So the actual source of that Arctic air isn't shut off, uh, if you will. If that warmth was to completely close in, you actually lose your, your core source of that cold air and it leads to a less long-term cool down. When we see it fully tapped in continuously, there's no telling how long this can last. So that is a very cold look. Let's get into some of the details and specifics of these model runs as far as the impacts expected. And we do see continued precipitation along the west. Although once the waters or the air just above the water there offshore of the western United States gets warmer, higher pressure is likely to develop and we will see less storminess by that point. But for now, we continue to see high amounts of activity. Same thing for the Gulf states up the east coast as we start to see more and more of this flow, even this at times offshore throughout the model runs. Uh, so this is looking more and more optimistic for you guys. Here is the total snowfall in the European model where we do see huge amounts for the Cascades, Sierra Nevada, Rockies. This is actually upticked a little bit, although we do see the higher pressure set up. They do just expect a high uh, concentration of storms moving through even the very far southern Rockies into areas of western Texas there. Then we can see some of the Midwest, Plains, Great Lakes, Northeast, and Mid-Atlantic seeing their fair share of opportunities for snowfall. And even this medium, long, medium range, something in there, storm that moves through, bringing snowfall from areas in East Texas, Arkansas, Mississippi, Tennessee, Kentucky, West Virginia, Ohio, Pennsylvania, and then up into the Northeast. That one would impact very many states, but it is far enough out to where we still are taking that one with a grain of salt. It's not a sure thing by any means. And really, today is the first round of model runs that have shown it exactly like that. So we're going to monitor it, but it's something to just keep our eyes on. The GFS model obviously is missing that detail. So again, another reason to really be a little bit skeptical for now. The West is very active on this one as well, which is boding well for confidence. And we do see the Midwest, Mid-Atlantic, Northeast, Great Lakes, all of those areas seeing their opportunities. So this is a similar look, but definitely a little bit less optimistic than the European model for now. With all that stuff being said, guys, be sure to subscribe. We upload every single day. You can even hit the bell icon for daily notifications. When we upload, so you never miss one, be sure to like the video if you did enjoy it. Leave a comment down below, and I'll see you guys in the next video.